Would you turn with me today? Well, <laughs> turn to Hebrews chapter 6. We are there. We are there. And some of you have been ready for me to get there. In fact, some of you came in packing today just to see what I'm going to say. Well, good. I'm so glad to be there. Hebrews chapter 6. And we're going to talk today about part one. We're going to move slowly. Because if you don't, you miss the riches of what he's saying here. This is part one, and I want to entitle the message, Grow Up. <laughs> Grow Up, part one. Now, I want you to see something now. Hebrews 6, hang on there. I want you to see a comparison of Scripture. Now, we know, I don't believe that Paul wrote Hebrews, but somebody that had been discipled by Paul had been around him did write them. So they're Pauline doctrine all the way through it. I want you to see something. You'll know immediately where I'm coming from. You'll know how I view the book of, of Hebrews. And I'm a learner like the rest of you. But turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, I want you to see a parallel here, almost identical to what he's saying in Hebrews. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I'm going to read verses 1, 2, and 3 with you. Now, I know that in these days of iPads and iPhones, you don't hear the turning of the pages as much as you used to. If you have your Bible, though, kind of rattle them when you turn. It's kind of a good sound. But I know that some of you are high tech. I just want to encourage you. I have an iPhone and I have an iPad. I just wanted you to know that. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Now watch, he points back. And then he says, indeed, even now you're not yet able, for you are still fleshly. Can a believer come into the faith, and can he still be fleshly? I didn't write this. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? Now turn with me to Hebrews chapter 5. I want you to begin, re I'm going to begin reading in verse 11 of chapter 5. I want you to see the comparison, almost identical. It says in verse 11, Hebrews 5, concerning him, Melchizedek, that he's just been talking about, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity. All right, now turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. I want you to see it. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 10. He says, according to the grace of God which was given to me, Paul says, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation. And another's building on it, but each man must be careful how he builds on it. It's either going to be by faith or it's going to be of works of the flesh, which he's going to mention. Verse 11. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold and silver and precious stones, that's those works of faith that are going to endure the testing one day. And then wood, hay, and straw. You see the difference of the two qualities there of work. Each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. In other words, the fire cannot destroy the righteous work that Christ produced at salvation. Now watch. Turn to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. And let's look at verse 7 and 8. He says in verse 7, For ground that drinks the rain which often falls on it, and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God, a reward. Verse 8, 
But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless, and watch, and close to being cursed. And it ends up being burned. I want, you to, I want to ask you a question. Do you see the resemblance of the two different passages? Almost identical to what he's saying. You see, I do not believe that the book of Hebrews is written to get the audience saved. Anytime you factor in two to three audiences that he's writing to, you've confused the whole flow of the book. I believe it is written to Jewish believers to get them to grow up, to move on into maturity. Just like Paul wrote to the church of Corinth, this letter is written to these Jewish believers. Because of their lack of attention to the things that they had heard, they had drifted. They were warned about this in chapter 2 and in, in verse 1. Because they drifted, they doubted, and they, and they failed to consider Jesus in every circumstance of their life that they faced. They were warned about this in chapter 3 and verse 1. They had intentionally walked right back into the spiritual nursery and were acting like infants needing to be spoon-fed and could only receive milk and could not receive the meat. They were unable to understand the new covenant and their completeness in Christ. We saw in the last of chapter 5, they had become dull of hearing. When they should have been teachers, instead they had to be taught again the elementary principles of the Christian life. Just like their Jewish ancestors of ancient history, they had fallen into the trap of unbelief. As a result, they ended up short of, of entering into their rest, which only comes when we yield and we trust Christ and trust His Word. So the author of Hebrews calls these believers to grow up and to move on into maturity. They didn't need to be taught the ABCs of the faith, again, of salvation and all that it encompasses. They needed to, be, to act upon what they already knew. They had already laid the foundation. Look at verse 1. Therefore, of chapter 6 of Hebrews, therefore leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity. Not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God. And let us, when you see a therefore, we've said it a hundred times, haven't we? We'll always look to see what it's there for. Even though you're dull of hearing and have need of someone to teach you the elementary principles of, the, of faith in Christ, and even though you can only handle milk and not meat, and even though you cannot discern good from evil, I'm not going to pamper your flesh. I'm not going to hang around and pamper your flesh, he says. But instead, I'm going to go on to the deeper things of Christ who is our high priest and who constantly represents us in heaven. That is, if you're willing to go with me. He says, therefore, leaving the elementary teachings about the Christ. The word leaving is the word aphiimi, which means I'm going to dismiss the subject. I'm going to move on. Aorist tense. I've made a choice. I'm moving on. It's like he's saying, I will not allow your immaturity to cause me to go back and rehash what you already know. It's time to grow up. We're going to move on. When my father died and I was in the home when he had that massive heart attack and the doctor was there with him and the doctor came out. He had known me since I was little. And I was 24 years old and had really goofed around in college. I, I never was criminal. And I just uh, was bored. I loved college. It was just class I didn't like. And I think I'd been in the third year of my second year. <laughs> and he walked up to me in the living room. The doctor had realized my father was going to go on to be with the Lord. Who, and he did at noon that day. He said, Wayne, if you've ever thought about growing up, son now would be a good time and that's exactly what the author of hebrews is saying to these people grow up therefore leaving the elementary teaching about the christ let us press on to maturity the vein, the main verb comes into play right here the main verb in that verse is pressing on this is the word pharaoh it means to bring it means to carry to bear now when it's in the middle passive as it is here uh, it means to make up your mind and allow yourself to be carried on into the deeper things that I really want to, to take you to. The middle voice signifies they could make the choice, but the passive part of that verb means that they could not mature in their own power. And this is so important for us to hear. In fact, the main verb is in the present tense. 
Now, this is a process. This is not an overnight experience. Spiritual maturity does not come with our self-efforts. It's not a checklist. I did this, 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 and therefore I'm spiritual. I know this much more than you do, therefore I'm spiritual. No, it comes to surrender to Christ in every situation we face, in every choice that we make. It's, it's Colossians 2.6. It says, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus, so walk you in him comes only by our willingness to cooperate with Christ and as we willingly submit to his truth. Let us allow ourselves, the author of Hebrews is saying, to be carried out or taken out of the dullness of hearing our, special, our spiritual lethargy, our inability to discern good and evil. Now, and, and, and he wants them to go on and grow up. Now, what is this spiritual maturity going to involve for these Jewish believers? What is it going to involve? It involves, as the verse says, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works. Now, that little word, again, tells us everything we need to know. It helps us to see that these believers have already laid a foundation. And the word foundation is the word themileos, and it's that which is laid down. In other words, that which is first laid. If you're going to build a building, you lay out that foundation. Everything else rests upon it. Everything else builds upon it. Remember 1 Corinthians 3.10, according to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, Paul says, and another is building on it, but each man must be careful how he builds on it. It's either going to be by faith, which is going to last, or it's going to be works of the flesh, which will be burned. He says, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. It refers here in this particular passage to the fundamentals of the basic doctrines of salvation that these believers had already laid down. He calls this foundation that has already been laid the foundation of repentance from dead works. Now, the word repentance is metania. And metania in the New Testament means to change one mind, one's mind that affects their behavior. If it doesn't affect our behavior, there's been no repentance. Somebody can say, well, I've really changed my mind. Well, until it's seen in our actions, there's been no repentance. So here it is attached to dead works. Repentance from dead works. They had changed their mind about something and were now in something new. No matter how you shake it, no matter how you twist it, no matter how you turn it, he's speaking of salvation not, that is not of works. Nothing about our salvation from, from the inception of it to when we were saved and birthed into the kingdom all the way through. Nothing is about fleshly works. He says in Ephesians 2.8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no, no one may boast. Anything the flesh produces before the cross and after the cross is nothing more than dead works. These Jewish Immature believers had left Judaism. They had left the dead works of its ritualistic system when they received Christ into their heart. They turned, they'd left it. They'd walked away from it. They had laid the foundation in Christ when they received him. They knew that the fundamental truth of their salvation was that the works that the law demanded did not save them. It did not save them. In fact, it condemned them. Everything they did was condemned. Isaiah, their major prophet, says all of our righteousness is nothing more than filthy rags. Salvation only comes by, by Jesus Christ and what he does in our life. Hebrews 10.1, and we'll get there one of these days, says, For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So by their choosing to trust Christ, they had laid a foundation upon which everything now was to be built upon it. A brand new way of living, a brand new way of making choices, a brand new way of living your life. But they could no longer discern the difference between that which was good and that which was evil, that which was spiritual and that which was fleshly. Back in verse 14 of chapter 5, it tells us that only the mature can discern between the good and evil. They're the only ones that seem to understand this. So the author of Hebrews calls them into maturity, calls them into a different way of living. In essence, he says, don't go back to trusting your flesh, which can only produce 
dead works. You know, you know better than that. How many times it gets into our own life, doesn't it? I'm not Jewish by birth. I, I'm a Gentile that got saved, but it's the same thing. We can, anytime we get back into works, the same thing Paul wrote to the Galatians. So what are the fundamentals of our salvation that form this foundation that they and we stand on? What is it that takes us on into maturity? What do we need to walk away from and into? Well, there's several things mentioned here. And, and we're only going to look at, at a couple of them today. and We'll finish that up next week. But first of all, faith, the thing that we need to understand, one of the fundamentals of our salvation is that faith alone in Christ alone saves us and sanctifies us. Faith alone in Christ alone saves us and sanctifies us. There is no power in the dead works of our flesh before salvation and after salvation. Listen to what he said. Therefore, leaving the elementary teachings about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works. Now watch. He connects a sentence to that. And of faith toward God. Repentance from the dead works of the flesh and faith in Christ. They're two sides of the same coin. I remember when I knew Roy Hessian and Ian Thomas. Both of them thought they were preaching two different messages. They thought they were on opposite sides of the coin. And in fact, they were, but it was the same coin. Roy could take you to the cross, and he would confession and understand the wickedness of our flesh. Ian took you from the cross. So there were both sides of that. Too. There were both sides of the same coin. One can't repent from dead works of his flesh without trusting Christ. Trusting Christ becomes, faith in Christ becomes the evidence the essential evidence of having repented from dead works. If I've repented from my dead work, then I'm going to be trusting Christ. There is no other way to look at it. It is the evidence not only of having received Christ, but it is the evidence also of living out the Christian life. Faith is the DNA of all believers. Now, these Jewish believers, <laughs> of all people, should have understood that. And they did at one time when they received Christ. But they needed to shape up now and act upon it. They're being persecuted. The threat is to go back to Judaism. They need to understand. You can't go back to what is already dead. You, you come over here and build off the foundation that has been laid, which is Christ Jesus. As I read through Hebrews, as I study through it, and I'm a learner, as you are, repentance from dead works and faith in Christ, they're all basic to everything he says in the whole epistle. Everything is about that. So the first basic of our salvation is that everything we do is supposed to be by faith alone in Christ alone. You know, I love Galatians 2.20. That's one of my life's verses. And it says, I have been crucified with Christ. The old apostle Paul, the greatest religionist that ever lived. And it's no longer I who live. What's different about you, Paul? He says, but Christ lives in me. That's the difference. And the life which I now live in the flesh, the same body I had before, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. You see, we've got to understand if we're going to move on into maturity, the very basic of our salvation that laid the foundation in Christ, everything was about faith in him. We couldn't save ourselves. He saved us. And that's what we build off of from that point on. It's every, every decision, everything we do in life is trusting him. Life hits us upside the head and we lay it all before him and trust him. God, I know you had the power to save me. I know you have the power to keep me and you're going to sustain me and you're going to take me through and I'm going to trust you and I'm only going to trust you. That's the Christian life. That's the way we live. That's the way we were saved. That's the way we live. And these Hebrews that were looking, these Jewish believers that were looking to go back to Judaism, the author of Hebrews is saying, what are you doing? You're going back to dead works. Build on the foundation that you've already laid. Make sure that what you do is by faith, which comes from hearing, which comes from the word of God. So we must understand that Christ alone saves us Christ alone sanctifies us. As we say yes to him, he continues to set us apart unto himself and use us for his glory. But the second thing he points to here, 
And everything he's doing here is looking back to what they've come out of and the foundation they now have in Christ. Only Christ alone can cleanse us. Only Christ alone can cleanse us. He adds in verse 2, of instructions about washings. Now, the word instruction is the word that means teaching. The word washings is the word baptismos. And many of us think that that has to be baptism. Well, no, no, it's not. It's plural. And literally means washings, plural, and cleansings, plural. Teachings on washings is what he's saying. You've walked away from that. This is before the cross. This is before the, found, the, the foundation was laid. The word washings is not to be confused with the word baptisma, which is baptism as water baptism that we have that gives evidence of our salvation. It doesn't save us. We don't, we, we're not saved by anything external. But when we are baptized, it's a public witness of what has already taken place in our life. But that's not what he's pointing to. He's still looking back to what they've come out of and the new foundation that has been laid in the Lord Jesus. And I believe he's referring to the external cleansings and washings that were a part of the Jewish ritual of the Old Covenant that they had come out of. In chapter 9, again, we haven't gotten there, but in chapter 9, verse 10 of Hebrews, it says, since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, plural, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. This is what the, the, the old covenant was all about. These cleansings and washings were, not, not, were both hygienic, but they were also symbolic of the spiritual cleansing that would come one day in Christ. But they were only symbolic. That's all they were. You cannot do something external that's going to cleanse you on the inside. They were a far cry from the true spiritual inward cleansing that only Jesus can bring through his blood. Only Christ, our high priest, offers this in the new covenant. It was the overzealous Pharisees who actually added more and more washings. They were great at adding law to anything that the people were responsible to. In Mark chapter 7, verse 4, and when they, had, when they came, when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as the washings of cups and pitchers and copper pots. They even accused Jesus one time that he was, was sinful because he didn't wash his hands before he ate. But Jesus Christ is the only one that can wash us inwardly of the defilement of sin. And what that does, it sets us up so that we can continue to serve him. There's no spiritual cleansing apart from the Lord Jesus. There's no external work that we can do for penance. There's, there's nothing we can do to cleanse the inside except by coming to him and Jesus' blood cleansing us. The author of Hebrews will address this again in Hebrews chapter 9. Let me read the words of Hebrews chapter 9, 13 on, and 14. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works? Why? To serve the living God. So his point is that these believers knew better. They knew better. They've come out of an old, they've come into the new. They've laid the foundation in Christ. Everything now has changed. They can't go back to that old way. They were digressing backward when they would go back to Judaism, back to the dead works which are not acceptable unto God. To do this, as Paul spoke to the Galatians, they would stumble out of the sphere of grace that, that, that could help them. If I'm not going to live up under the grace, the transforming, enabling power of Christ, then I put myself over here, and that's where the misery and the discouragement comes in my Christian wall. Well, because of their persecution, they were tempted to go back to Judaism. But by returning back to Judaism, they would rebuild what at salvation they had destroyed. Paul says in Galatians 2.18, For if I rebuild what I once have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. And verse 19 says, For through the law... I died to the law. Why, Paul? So that I might live unto God. You want to live unto God and see Him produce the fruit in your life, to see Him do the, the good works in your life, or do you want to live over here under the performance mentality 
of the law. Paul says, I walked away from it. I've laid a new foundation, and that foundation is Christ. And everything I do now is radically different than the way I used to live. The greatest religionist that ever lived is trying to tell them, folks, you're wanting to go back into the very thing that I've been delivered from. To go back to that which is of the flesh is to go back which is the evil. As Paul said in Romans 7, 18, in that classic verse, once you get back up on the law, you'll see this. For I know that nothing good dwells in me. And then he clarifies it. That is in my flesh. To further illustrate that, this in our text, he goes on and adds the world phrase, the laying on of hands. That's very significant. Although the laying on of hands is used in many ways, and it's used especially in the new covenant, but we're not talking about the new covenant. We're talking about what was going on before they laid the foundation in Christ, how they've come out of that, how they've got a brand new day in their life. But it was also used, and it was used in Jewish terminology to receive a blessing, but it was also used as a part of the sacrificial ritual on the Day of Atonement. Remember, he's been talking about the high priesthood of Christ. He's been trying to get them to understand that he died once for all, and it points them back to the ritual of the Day of Atonement. As recorded in Leviticus 16, there were two goats that were cast lots for on the Day of Atonement. One goat was sacrificed for the sins of the people. It was a very ruthless thing because life is in the blood, and the, the goat was taken in and offered. But the other goat was different. It was a scapegoat. That's where we get the term scapegoat. After the first goat was sacrificed for the sins of the people, the, the high priest would lay his hands on the second goat and confess all the sins of the people. And thus the goat was sent out never to return, into the wilderness never to return. Now that was the picture. That was just symbolic. The act of laying on of hands on the animal had the idea of transferring the sin of the people, uh, the sins of the people to the animal and then sending it out never to return. Now, again, that practice was just symbolic. It was only a shadow. It, it was nothing that would, would cleanse anybody within. It was a picture of what was going to happen one day when the Lord Jesus has, who was coming and who now has come. All of the things mentioned in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, that comprised the foundation of salvation in their lives, that they had already laid. These are believers. Every, all the things he points to is what they walked out of. Every Jewish believer had left them. When he bowed before Christ, just like Paul said, I want, I've destroyed that. It's a brand new day. I used to work in my flesh. I'm over here now. It's a brand new covenant. Everything I do, I don't want the dead works that flesh has produced. I want only the works that Christ produces in me as I learn to trust him and to obey and yield to his word. You see, they didn't need to hear this again. They needed to grow up and act on what they already knew. Going back would not solve it. They needed to move on and allow themselves to be carried on into maturity, which was a lifelong process. It was something that wasn't going to happen overnight. That's what he's trying to bring to them. So salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone. Only Christ alone can cleanse us and sanctify us. Now, here's the question. How do we today, 21st century, as believers, grow up? Because the Bible doesn't evolve. It's absolute. It stays exactly what it says. means what it says, says what it means. And so here we are today in a different time, in a different culture, and yet God creates his own culture within a culture. So what is this culture? It's a culture of trusting him. So for me to grow up and move on into maturity, knowing these two basics of salvation, first of all, I've got to understand, we all have to understand the futility of any fleshly work whether it's rebellious or whether it's religious. You see, this is where our flesh gets involved. We try to push it or we try to pull it. No, listen, it must be by faith. And faith only comes from hearing, and hearing comes from the Word of God. If I'm not going to be in the Word, if I'm not going to let the Word be in me, don't, don't, I can't tell anybody I'm walking by faith. I'm in a brand new day. Foundation has been laid. Everything has changed now. I'm in the new covenant. I don't live in that old performance mentality that all religion demands. We must understand the absolute futility of any fleshly work. But also, we need to daily ask ourselves, ask ourselves, what or who are we placing, whom are we placing our trust? Who are we placing our trust in? Is it the church? Is it the leadership of the church? Is it this person? Is it that person? Or is it Christ? Is it Christ? 
That's the bottom line. We need to, need to daily ask ourselves that question. And we need to understand that only when we are bowed before Christ and openly willing to admit our own sin, only when we're willing to do that, he already knows, but confession is not for his benefit. Confession is for our benefit. And as we come before him, we recognize even in confession how wicked our flesh is. And remember, it's an exchange life. It's not just a change life. It's all that I'm not, that I'm willing to admit before him that he already knows for all that he is. It's a brand new day. It's a brand new way of living. Everything, everything has changed. And this is the problem. There's a trap. Because we, get fall, we fall right back into I can do it, I can do it, I can do it, I can. Just let me do it. We'll get her done. We'll fix it. We'll fix it. No, we will not. We will not. Only Christ, only Christ, only Christ can do it. And only when we trust Him. I love the place that God has us all for such a time as this. I love it. Look at that <laughs> totally impossible situation that we're dealing with, that wise and everything else. And I'm thinking every day, you know what God's using that for for us right now? Somebody asked me the other day, you think we messed up by building all these facilities? Absolutely not. I believe we're right in the middle of God's purposes. He uses anybody to get, to get us to where he wants us to be. I believe what he's using all of this for is to teach us afresh how to trust him. And it's only going to be him. It's only going to be him. And until we come to that, we've gone back beyond the foundation. We've gone back beyond that which we have laid already. When we receive Christ. Back to that which we destroyed. We've gone back to thinking we can do it. Oh no. We need to grow up. We need to act on the foundation. And build off of it by faith. Which fire cannot destroy. One day when our works are tested. Well I don't use videos. Most of you know that. I have to laugh. Diana told me one time. says, Why should you? You're your own video. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought about that before. <laughs> However, since I've been here, maybe I've used one. Levi, I just love Levi. Levi found this video, and I'm telling you, the more I've watched it, the more it says exactly what I think the author of Hebrews is saying. You want to know what a believer who refuses to grow up looks like? You want to know what it looks like when he stays on milk, 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 and it's as far as he can go? because he's not willing to act on the things that he already knows by trusting Christ. I think this will give you a visual that will help you in understanding why Hebrews was written. So with the lights down, I want you to watch this video. I just couldn't help it. That's what he's saying. Well, what would God be saying to the church of Jesus Christ in the 21st century? He's saying to all of us, grow up. Live off the foundation that you've already laid, which is only by faith in Christ. Faith alone in Christ alone. It's the only way the Christian life can be lived. Anything else is dead works. Anything else is dead works. For the cross and after the cross. It's a brand new day brand new way God has for us.